Almost a year ago, I decided to make a video about the writing techniques used to create the dialogue between Tywin and Joffrey. As a complete shock to me, this went on to be one of the channel's most popular videos and launched the Dialogue Dive series. Well, it might have taken a while, but I am back again with another Dialogue Dive for Game of Thrones. It's nice to reminisce about the good times of the show. You know, before we got... You are my queen. Yeah. Anyway, because I am a hopeless fanboy, today's video will be featuring Tywin again. But instead of verbally pimp slapping his inbred grandson, Papa Lannister will be facing off against someone his own size, Elena Tyrell. Now, for anyone new to the channel or unaware what I am about, this video will not just be an appreciation of the dialogue. Aside from making videos for YouTube, my day job is being an editor for novels and scripts, and my favorite thing in the world is helping others understand the nuance and intricacies of writing. Instead of just giving a review of the scene, my goal would be to perform a professional breakdown of some of the more subtle writing choices of the dialogue so that you all might learn and use the techniques in your own writing. So here will be the game plan. I will play a clip from Game of Thrones Season 3 Episode 6, The Climb. When dialogue is given that sparks my interest, I will pause the clip and give my commentary on its narrative function and purpose. If you would like to watch the clip in full beforehand without my commentary, I will include a link in the description. Oh, and one last thing, stick around until the end of the video for a pretty major announcement for the channel. Anyway, let's get right into it. Impossible. Why? My grandson is the pride of High Garden, the most desirable bachelor in all seven kingdoms. Your daughter is rich, the most beautiful woman in all seven kingdoms, and the mother of the king. Old. One thing to establish first is that like all great scenes, this scene follows a three-act structure, making it its own mini-story inside a story. There is an introduction where the relevant characters and conflicts are introduced a midsection with rising action, which in this case is ever-heightening dialogue, and a climax with a resolution. This underlying structure acts as a skeleton to the scene, keeping the dialogue focused and tight around a central pathway. All of the dialogue in the first two acts are in service to the third act, making it easier for the writers to choose early dialogue options. But another awesome aspect of this conversation between Tywin and Elena is the subtext. Subtext can be understood as the unsaid underlying message of dialogue. Think of it as a conversation within a conversation. In my Tywin vs Joffrey video, I noted that Tywin made excellent use of subtext, and he does it again here. As I said previously, this scene acts as a story within a story. It is just a small piece of a much bigger episode. But even inside this scene, underneath all the dialogue and bargaining and negotiating, the subtext creates a personal struggle between Tywin and Elena. Each of them wants control of the conversation. Across the entire series, a consistent trait with both of these characters is that they seek domination when interacting with others. Forgive my sister. What she lacks in diplomacy, Do she makes... shut up, dear. Anything from you? No. Good. I am Queen Regent, not some brood man. You're my daughter! You will do as I command, and you will marry Loras Tyrell. Opportunities like these, when two characters share the same competing trait, adds a second layer of structure to the scene and allows the dialogue to truly shine. One of the most important skills as an editor is noticing patterns and systems. As we watch, notice these two identified patterns for the dialogue. The dialogue will both match the function of the act that it's in and further the character's traits of dominance. Believe it or not, while all these structures and guidelines might make the options for dialogue feel restricted, they are actually liberating. Dialogue between two characters, especially two intelligent characters, has the possibility to manifest in an infinite number of ways, and all of those choices and options can be paralyzing to a writer. By having a narrative focal point to keep centered on, in this case, a three-act structure and conversational dominance, the writers gave themselves a guideline on what to and to not write. Anyway, now that we understand the underlying makeup of the scene, we can get into looking at what makes the dialogue so good. Let's go back to the very first words spoken by each of the characters. Impossible. 
Why? All right, so if you're a word nerd like me, this simple opening of dialogue is actually really cool. So generally, less is always more with dialogue. You want to be able to convey as much information as possible to your reader or audience without boring them with long, protracted explanations. This opening is the essence of that. In just two words, the audience already knows what 90% of this scene is about. Tywin is requesting something of Elena, Elena believes it cannot be done, and Tywin is pressing Elena about that refusal. Impossible. Why? If you boil it down, that is all the scene is about, and we as the audience were able to learn that in two words. This also acts as a great hook. Nothing draws in an audience like conflict, and starting a scene where two characters are at odds, no matter how nondescript, is a fantastic way to spark interest. Now, let's rewatch the rest of the opening lines. My grandson is the pride of High Garden, the most desirable bachelor in all seven kingdoms. Your daughter is rich, the most beautiful woman in all seven kingdoms, and the mother of the king. Old. Again, I consider this to be fantastic dialogue. In just these few short opening sentences, all of the details that comprise the primary information for the scene have been laid out. Even someone who had never seen anything of Game of Thrones could understand the conflict of this scene. And that's pretty incredible, seeing as how this is the 26th episode of the show. The dialogue informs the audience of Elena's position, that she has an unmarried grandson. My grandson is the pride of High Garden, the most desirable bachelor in all seven kingdoms. The dialogue also informs the audience of Tywin's position. Your daughter is rich, the most beautiful woman in all seven kingdoms. Finally, the dialogue informs us of why Elena is refusing Tywin and the mother of the king. Old. The dialogue puts the audience in a position where they can infer the scene is about marriage without actually having to explicitly state it. Remember, since this scene can be understood in a three-act structure, we are currently in the introduction, which is perfect, because we have just been introduced to the relevant characters and the conflict. This is our first layer of structure. But there was also the recognition of two layers, the second being each character striving for dominance of the conversation. Notice how Tywin and Elena speak in relation to their family. Tywin and Elena are effectively hyping up Cersei and Loras. And this isn't because of any strong familial admiration, it's because Cersei and Loras are the bargaining chips for this negotiation. The more valuable a bargaining chip is, the more leverage one side has over the other. This is why as soon as Elena hyped up Loras, My grandson is the pride of High Garden, the most desirable bachelor in all seven kingdoms and then went to devalue Cersei, your daughter. Tywin stepped in to hype up Cersei. Is rich, the most beautiful woman in all seven kingdoms. Neither Elena or Tywin wants to be the person with the weaker position. And this all comes back to not only wanting to win the negotiation, but to be in control of the conversation. And all of this was just in the first 18 seconds. There is a reason why this is one of the best scenes of dialogue in the show. So. Let's keep watching. Her change will be upon her before long. I'll spare you the details of what will happen then. You men may have a stomach for bloodshed and slaughter, but this is another matter entirely. Here we see Elena condescend to Tywin about womanhood. This dialogue serves both of Elena's goals within the scene. Elena can devalue Cersei by questioning her ability to have children, while also taking superiority over Tywin in the conversation by saying she has knowledge that he never could. But Tywin does not take this line down. The years punish us as well, I promise you that. Here, Tywin fights back, saying he has his own personal experience that gives him unique knowledge, making him equal with Elena. It would also be good to note that since our characters and conflict have been established, the introduction is now finished, and the midsection with rising action can begin. Take notice of how the conversation takes a more serious, high-stakes form as the rising action continues. My stomach remains quite strong, however. The only thing that might turn it are details of your grandson's nocturnal activities. Do you deny them? Oh, not at all. A sword swallower through and through. Here, it is Tywin's turn to attempt to devalue Loras, and by extension, Elena's position in the conversation. Elena's defense to this is one she hasn't employed yet. 
instead of attempting to switch the conversation back to devaluing Cersei, she simply accepts Tywin's accusation of her grandson. Her play throughout the conversation is to frame Loras' actions as completely natural, as nothing to even notice, therefore stealing away Tywin's ability to use it against her. Did you grow up with boy cousins, Lord Tywin? Sons of your father's bannermen, squires, stable boys? Of course. And you... never... No. Not once? Not in any way? Never. Alright, only Elena Tyrell could get away with asking Tywin Lannister questions like this, and while being hilarious, these lines really impress how brash, confident, and formidable Elena is. It's great character building. True, we don't tie ourselves in knots over a discreet bit of buggery, but... Brothers and sisters... Where I come from, that stain would be very difficult to wash out. I will not breathe further life into a malicious lie by disgusting. This scene's entire exchange of dialogue is based around punch, counterpunch. It's completely systemic, and once you notice it, it's hard to miss. Elena says one thing, Tywin says the next. However, this last sequence offers a marked change in their interaction. Where Elena willingly accepted Tywin's criticism of Loras, Tywin could not and would not accept Elena's criticism of Cersei. Tywin refused to even continue the conversation on its current path, showing how much Elena's words actually got to him. In a scene where all the conflict is based around dialogue, this is the equivalent of showing the ebb and flow of a battle. Previous to this point, Tywin and Elena were at a stalemate. As soon as one said something, the other would retort with an equal counter. But narrative conflict to remain entertaining cannot be stagnant. Conflict must be dynamic. One side needs to gain and one side needs to lose. This ebb and flow is how twists and surprise endings are possible. Elena now has higher command of the conversation, and Tywin must now work to regain control. Now, if the rumors about my children were true, then Joffrey is no king at all, and House Tyrell is throwing its prize flower into the dirt. And if Cersei is too old to give Laura's children, we are throwing another prize flower into the dirt. It is a chance we simply cannot take. Here, we see Tywin's attempt to regain control both of the conversation and the negotiation. His strategy was to turn Elena's point back on her. Instead of giving into Tywin's ploy though, Elena shows her savvy and returns to her original easily defended argument of Cersei being too old. At this point, Elena's dialogue has given her a vice grip on the conversation, and therefore the battle of the subtext. No matter what Tywin says about Loras, he cannot change the reality of Cersei's age or her ability to have children, and therefore cannot strengthen his bargaining chip against Elena. Instead, Tywin starts down a different path, a path that coincidentally signals the end of the midsection and the start of the climax, where the stakes are at their highest and the conflict comes to a head. If you refuse to marry Loras to Cersei, I will name him to the King's Guard. I'm sure you're familiar with the King's Guard vows. He will never marry. He will never have children. No. The Tyrell name will fade. And High Garden will go to the children of Joffrey and Marjorie. With that, the power dynamics of the conversation have completely shifted. Tywin recognized that he could not change the reality of Cersei's age or her ability to have children, meaning he could not increase the power of his bargaining chip. What he brilliantly chose to do instead was change the reality of Loras's ability to have children. This is where the exchange turns from a simple conversation to a hostage situation. Tywin basically tells Elena, if we can't have Loras, no one can, including you. This continues the ebb and flow of the conflict that the dialogue represents, and now puts Tywin on top. You would have your grandson protected by someone who disgusts you. I would have my grandson protected by a skilled warrior who takes his vows seriously. So, shall I draw up the order? Or do you consent to this match? What we just saw there was the peak of the climax. Elena's only option to maintain some semblance of control in the conversation was to question Loras' ability to properly guard Joffrey. 
Of course, this means nothing to Tywin, as he really isn't concerned at all about Loras' skill as a Kingsguard. Tywin's given dialogue allows us to know that he only cares about removing Elena's leverage. Her once easily defended argument about Cersei is now irrelevant, as Tywin has removed Cersei from the dialogue equation. Tywin now has taken complete control of both the negotiation and the conversation, asserting dominance over Elena. The only thing left now is for the resolution. It's a rare enough thing, a man who lives up to his reputation. With Elena Tyrell being Elena Tyrell, she had to have the last word to retain some semblance of power, but ultimately, she conceded defeat. But note the dialogue that she used to do it. She never agrees to the marriage or acquiesces to Tywin. She simply states that Tywin is every bit as formidable as others have said. Even this small word choice in the dialogue is important when considering Elena's character. She is never one to admit defeat, and she always needs the last word. Tell Cersei. I wanted to know it was me. Anyway, I hope this video could help break down some of the more nuanced decisions made for this back and forth dialogue. Having a structure at the center of character interaction can really assist a writer in choosing what dialogue to make use of. In this scene's case, it was punch counterpunch centered around a negotiation, all with the subtext of conversational dominance. If this video has helped you at all and you like what you heard, consider commenting, liking, or subscribing to the channel. Or you could support the channel on Patreon to get some awesome perks. Lastly, the announcement that I have is a two-parter. First. I just want to let you guys know it might be a while until my next upload. I'm going through the totally enviable task of moving during a global pandemic, so I might not have access to all my video making material for a while. Hopefully my hiatus won't be any longer than a month or so, so sit tight. The second part of my announcement is actually the big news. When I do eventually return, I am planning on starting up a second channel. That channel will be a lot less formal and a lot more personal than this one. You'll actually be able to see my face, ask me questions, get specific advice on editing and writing, and hear my reviews and opinions on all sorts of fiction. I felt it was time for all of you who have been so supportive to get to know me a bit better, and that's what that second channel will be for. I'll make sure to keep you guys posted so you know exactly when and how all of this will go down. I'm really excited for it. Anyway, thank you all for watching to the end. As always, it was a pleasure, and I will talk to you all again soon.